Good morning. My presentation is based on chapter one of Professor Massimo Fagioli's book, The Liminal Papacy of Pope Francis, significantly subtitled, Moving Toward Global Catholicity. I want to emphasize the word moving. This is a process that is still taking place. This chapter, as is the whole book, is rich in historical contextualization and analysis. And including all the academic terms would require a much longer presentation. So I will highlight only a few threads in this heavily textured fabric in view of enticing you, the audience, if you have not already done so, to read the book in its entirety. I do this presentation with some trepidation, lest I do not do justice to the excellent work of Professor Fagioli. But I trust that whatever is amiss here, you will graciously fill in. The first chapter, Pope Francis, Global Catholic. Professor Fagioli points out that the papacy is a fascinating leadership role because it is the longest serving in history and because of its claim to be universal. The universality of the papacy has undergone a process of transform transformation into globalization. This process has reached its greatest development with Pope Francis, but it did not start with him. I'm going to first give an overview of the section on Catholicism and Western identity from Pius XII to Benedict XVI, which starts on page 26, if you have the book. And then I will concentrate on the section on from the ends of the earth, John the 23rd and Francis, who starts on page 21. Afterwards, I will leave you with some questions to elicit a dialogue. Of course, your own questions will have priority at this time. The papacy of Pope Pius XII was becoming a global papacy. And the Jubilee of 1950 was his way of calling for reconciliation after the two world wars and in the context of the Cold War. That's a direct quotation from Professor Fagioli's book. Pius XII was born in Italy. Now, his, his step into globalization was a small step, but it was a significant one. And it did not begin with him. It began in the late 19th century. But Fagioli points out that the evolution of the Pope's image in the last 150 years says more about the papacy than any theological definition. So for each Pope, he has an image. For Pope Pius XII, he is the diplomat Pope. Pope John XXIII was also a diplomat, as were his predecessors, Popes Pius XI and Pius XII. He earned a degree in theology in his early 20s, and he became very well versed in church history. Now let's look at some of the main steps of his papacy. Of course, we all know the Second Vatican Council, which he called in 1959 and formally opened in 1962. And many of us who are here remember that day. His publication of Matter and Magistra, his first encyclical in 1961, 
and of passion in terrorists in 1963. And he also ushered in the Vatican's Ostpolitik, the new policy towards the communist countries. We will talk a lot more about John the 23rd later, but now let's, let us just point out that Professor Fagioli characterizes him as the pastor pope. Paul VI, also born in Italy, he had to grapple uh, as, and this is a quotation from Professor Fagioli, with the conciliar and post-conciliar dimensions of the Catholic Church in a new global dimension. Now, his main points of global engagement, he undertook international trips. He advocated for peace and development, especially in his great encyclical, Popularum Progressio. And he attended an ecumenical meeting with the Patriarch of Constantinople, Athenagoras, in 1964. Professor Fagioli calls him the reformer pope. Pope John Paul II, the first pope not born in Italy since 1523, as we all know, he was born in Poland. These are his main accomplishments towards globalization. He accelerated the Catholic engagement into the ecumenical movement. He was a key international advocate for dialogue and peace among religions and for religious liberty. He met with Muslim youth in Casablanca in 1985. He was the first Pope to visit the synagogue of Rome, and that was in 1986. And he held the first interreligious meeting of prayer for peace in Assisi, and that was in 1986. And he was highly criticized for that but he undertook it anyway. And he visited Syria, Syria in 2001. Professor Fagioli calls him the international star pope. And this reminds us, reminded Sixto and I, of the cover from Time Magazine when Pope John Paul visited the United States the cover from, nine, from Time Magazine had him as the John Paul II superstar. Now this is a pause in this development. We all remember the terrorist attack of 9-11 of the year 2001. It impacted all of our lives and the course of our nation's history. It too had an impact on the Catholic Church. Let's take a little look at how it impacted the Catholic Church's reception of Vatican II, as Professor Fagioli points out. On the one hand, it confirmed the necessity of ecumenism, of religious liberty, of freedom of conscience, of interreligious dialogue. But on the other hand, it raised the voices of many people in objection to the churches promoting dialogue with other religions, especially with the Muslims. Those, they would say, that take advantage of the church's opening stance And now we come to Pope Benedict XVI. 
He continued the trajectories of John Paul II related to Vatican II. But he was much more cautious about ecumenism, interreligious dialogue, and dialogue with the modern world. Professor Fagioli calls him the theologian pope. Now I'm going to interject here a personal comment. This is not in Professor Fagioli's book. That's why I have it on the other side of the green line. In the year 2009, Pope Benedict gave an address on the World Day of Peace, and it was titled, Fight Poverty to Build Peace. Basically, he called on the world to remedy the marginalization of the world's poor that had been caused by global, globalization. And he said, this will only happen if people everywhere feel personally outraged by the injustices in the world. I mention this because this, this address of Pope Benedict inspired Catholics Confront Global Poverty, a program of Catholic Relief Services that still exists today. And it advocates for Catholics here in the United States to become globally involved in working to remedy that injustice for the world's poor. We have finished the Pope, the Popes through Pope Benedict, but now let's go to the second part of my presentation, which is the comparison between John the 23rd and Francis. The title comes from the ends of the earth, comes from the statement that Pope Francis made when he became Pope on March 13th of 2013, a moment which many of us remember. And when he introduced himself to the world, he said that his brother cardinals had gone to the ends of the earth to find a pope, referring to his native Argentina, part outside of Europe, outside of North America into the end of the world in South America. Both families of, of uh, Roncalli and of Mario Bergoglio originated in Northern Italy, come from Northern Italy. We know that Pope Francis family immigrated from Italy into Argentina. Both families were of limited financial means Roncalli's father was a sharecropper. Bergoglio's family was lower middle class. And Fagioli suggests that this is probably the reason why both popes were so interested or are so interested in the world's poor, because they lived poverty. Now, was one little interesting fact, both had issues with vacations. When from Cali was young, a seminarian. He was bothered by, vaca by vacations because they distracted him from his pious life. He overcame this over time, but this for him, vacations were a distraction. And interestingly enough, uh, Bergoglio has never taken any vacations since he became Pope. And as a matter of fact, he has turned Castel Gandolfo into a museum. There is a difference between Roncalli's world in the 1900s and Bergoglio's Argentina in 1950s, as we, as we can very well expect. Roncalli had a clerical education. Bergoglio explored more as a youth. There are no narratives of, of Roncalli uh, dating girls or anything like that, or holding any jobs. And we know that Pope Francis did have a girlfriend. 
and we know that he was a chemist and he was a bar bouncer and he was involved in sports in his native Argentina. So in that sense, their, their youth is very different. The political situations in both countries were similar, but not exactly the same, but I won't go into detail of that. And interesting, both were elected Pope at 76 years of age. And looking at their birth dates, uh, Pope Francis was born on December 17th, and Pope uh, John the 23rd was born in no, on December, uh, was born in November 24th. They both shared the same zodiac sign. They're both Sagittarius. For those of you who are interested in this, of course, this is a factoid. It is not really that important. More comparisons. The conclaves that, ex that elected these two popes, they ex expected to elect a man who would fix the institutional problems of the church without affecting the status quo. They expected to have short and uneventual, uneventual pontificates. Well, we can see now that we have lived through all this, how wrong their expectations were. Both uh, John the 23rd and Pope Francis experienced, experienced a spiritual rebirth during their lifetime. For John the 23rd, it began when he was still in his 20s, but it was a process that continued all through his life. And Professor Fagioli makes a comparison with the born again movements of American evangelicals. And he takes that term and he gives them to both folks. They are both born again folks, we could say. A little bit more about the spiritual conversion of, of Pope Francis. He spent two years in exile in a Jesuit community in Cordoba and came out a changed man. From being very authoritarian in his leadership style, he changed. And he called himself, himself after that to be a liberated man. Bergoglio was also influenced by the post-Vatican II experience of the Society of Jesus. And he had a personal connection with Pedro Arrupe, the re-founder of the society. There are four main points of convergence between these two popes. Both had a vision of the church reform as spiritual reform and through conciliar means. The conciliar means obviously for Pope John the 23rd was the ecumenical council. For, for Pope Francis, his emphasis on synodality and his calling of true extraordinary sinners on the family in two subsequent years. This is a direct quote from Professor Fagioli. For both popes, change is about conversion of the church from a predetermined model to a model following Jesus Christ in a recurrent call to the gospel as ultimate reference for the church. And the fourth point of a convergence, both had to deal with a dysfunctional bureaucratic machine in the, in the Vatican and both responded to that and much more because their ecclesiology was not focused only on the institution. Both faced an adverse geopolitical situation in the Catholic Church, which caused pushback for their pontificates. John XXIII received a lot of pushback when he published his encyclicals. And Pope Francis, we know, has received a lot of pushback when he has published his apostolic exhortations and his encyclicals. Now, let me just make one last point 
both popes share a new kind of universalism. They define universalism in the Latin sense of universa, all, all together, and not universalis, having general application. Let me just give you a little anecdote. This happened to me. One of my colleagues at work, I'm retired now, but when I was working, one of my colleagues told me she really wished that the parishes in our diocese, the Diocese of Palm Beach, would be more uniform in their liturgy, that they would all be the same, because, she said, the church is universal. She was, she was really referring to that sense of universal, that having a general application for all. I would call it a cookie cutter type of universalism that we all have to fit into the same mold. But he was not, and I told her, the church is universal. That does not mean that it's uniform. At that time, I had not read Professor Pagliotti's book, but now I could explain it better to her. And I am going to conclude here, not, this is my next to the last slide, but I want to go back to go to a, an image that Pope Francis repeats in many of his documents. And actually, Professor Fagioli includes in the next chapter of the book, but I'm just kind of going forward to the next chapter, just a tiny little bit. And I am going to quote directly from a, a Francis's Evangelium Gaudium, paragraph 236, which, which by Gioli cites on page 59 of his book. This is Francis. Here, our motto is not the sphere which is no greater than its parts. Where every point is equidistant, you see it here, equidistant from the center. And there is no difference between them. They're all the same. Instead, it is a polyhedron, which reflects its, which reflects the converg convergence of all its parts, each of which preserves its distinctiveness. Pastoral and political activity alike seek to gather in this polyhedron, the best of each. There is a place for the poor and their culture, their aspirations and their potentials. Now to the very last slide that I'm going to share. I just want to have one more quote from Pope Francis in Evangelii Gaudium, and it also appears in Professor Fagioli's uh, book. The people of God is incarnate in the peoples of the earth, each of which has its own culture. Now, the, the title of this chapter is Pope Francis, a global Catholic. So how would we describe him as a Pope? Again, the very fitting would be Pope Francis, global Pope. With this, I conclude my presentation, but I have some questions for you. But I want to stress that if you have any questions about what I have said, please ask them now. That is more important. But my two questions are this. What would you say are the challenges Pope Francis faces as a global Pope? And secondly, how does Pope Francis challenge us? Mm -hmm.